Founders Artful Designer, Episode 25, Selling Your Ideas to Your Graphic Design Clients. Welcome to the Resourceful Designer Podcast, offering solutions to streamline your graphic and web design business so you can get back to designing. And now, your host. He tried to avoid social media, but now he's addicted to Twitter. Mark Decote. Welcome to another episode of Resourceful Designer. I'm thrilled that you've been able to join me today as I discuss the importance of trying to sell your ideas to your graphic design clients. Now, before I go any further, I want to remind you that any and all links or anything mentioned in this episode can be found on the show notes page by visiting resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 25. Now, if you want to reach out to me for any reason, maybe just to say hi, or if you have a question about running a graphic design business that you'd like me to answer on a future episode, you can reach me by either filling out my feedback form at resourcefuldesigner.com slash feedback, sending me an email at feedback at resourcefuldesigner.com, or you can follow me on Facebook at facebook.com slash resourceful designer or on Twitter at resourceful D. I received two new iTunes reviews this week, both in the US. And the first one comes from JT Siren and says, great resources and ideas. This podcast is full of good resources and ideas for beginner designer like myself. Mark takes a holistic approach to educating his listeners about many different aspects of both being a designer and running your own business. Very helpful. Well, thank you for that. And the second one, also in the U.S., came from Randy Roy, and he says, Great podcast. Love the podcast, love the advice, but I especially love the resources. Helped me out tremendously. Well, thank you to both of you for those kind reviews. The more reviews I get in iTunes, the easier it is for people to find this podcast when they're searching for graphic design within iTunes. Now, if you're enjoying the podcast and would like to leave me a review, no matter what country you're in, just visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash iTunes, and it'll redirect you to the podcast's page where you can click and leave a review. And now it's time for this week's resource of the week. Now I've shared this one before, but I want to bring it up again because it saved my bacon this week. And that's Backup Buddy. Backup Buddy is one of the number one tools for backing up your WordPress website. And I can tell you that it paid for itself this week. Not with a client site, but actually with the resourceful designer website. Now Backup Buddy doesn't just back up websites. It has some other lesser-known features that are really, really handy for web developers. And one of those features is the tools that allow you to easily migrate a website from one server to another. So if you're somebody like me who designs a client website on a special, you have a test server or a sandbox, or maybe it's a local server on your own computer, and you build the website there, and then once it's finished, you move it to its proper area, you know that sometimes that can be a little bit tricky. I personally have a domain name that I do all my testing and building under. And then whenever it's done, what I used to do is I would just contact my hosting provider and tell them that the website at this website, my testing website, is now complete. Can you move it to its actual domain and replace everything that's there with this new website? And then they would take care of it for me. Now, of course, what I would have to do afterwards would be go in and make sure that all links and things were updated Because sometimes an image, instead of pointing to the new domain, might still point to the image that was still sitting on my test domain. So I would have to go through the website and make those little minor updates. And sure enough, whenever I deleted the website from my test domain or reinstalled WordPress because I'm starting a different website, the client would call me up and say, hey, Mark, there used to be a photo on this page or there used to be a document you can download. And for some reason, that's not working anymore. And sure enough, when I go in and check, it's because it's one of those links that I had forgot to update from my test server to the permanent server. But since I started using Backup Buddy and their migration assistant, it makes it so much easier to move stuff over because it'll actually search. You can have it search for all instances of the one server address or the one domain and change it so that when you upload it to the new domain, everything will be working. So that's a great feature of Backup Buddy. But it can also be used for a site-wide find and replace. And that's what I used it for this week. I updated one of my plugins on Resourceful Designer. It's a plugin I use for short codes. And if you're not familiar with what short codes is, it allows you to put in a block of text or maybe some HTML or some PHP or whatever coding or maybe an image or anything you want. And then it assigns a short code, which is a little value inside square brackets that you can put anywhere in your website. Anytime you put that in, that code will be put in that place. It's very similar to a PHP include if you know any PHP. So I have a bunch of those throughout the website. But this week I updated the plugin and a warning came up telling me that the newest version of WordPress 4.4 
change something in their API for short codes, and the way short codes were put together will no longer work. So now they were recommending creating short codes a different way. The old way used to be square bracket SC colon and then the value you assigned it and then close the square bracket. Now they recommended square bracket SC space name equals open quote the value close quote close square bracket. So I had to go through my entire site and change everywhere that there was a short code. And that's where I turned to Backup Buddy because Backup Buddy's migration assistance can also be used as a find and replace. So all I had to do was enter the original value in the search for and replace it with the new value. And it searched through the entire website and changed all instances of the old short code. So I was so happy that I had Backup Buddy installed on the website for that one reason alone. Now, I'll tell you, I did mess something up in doing it and I ended up actually breaking the website <laughs> and it was just a goof on my part. But again, with Backup Buddy, all I had to do was click and say, I want it to back up to the most recent database backup, click to restore. And within about 30 seconds, my website was back up and running with the previous version of the database. And then everything was fine again. So as I said, Backup Buddy really saved a lot of time, saved my bacon this week. If I didn't have that installed on resourcefuldesigner.com, I don't know how long it would have taken me to get the site back up and running. So I've been touting Backup Buddy for a long time, recommending it to people, saying you, it's a must-have for any WordPress website. But until this week, I never had anything to actually back up that claim. But believe me, now I'm an even bigger advocate of the application. Now, if you run WordPress websites, either for yourself or your clients, and you're interested in learning more about Backup Buddy, visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash Backup Buddy and give it a try. The peace of mind is well worth it. And now on to today's topic, which is selling your ideas to your graphic design clients. Now, I got this idea last week from a thread in a graphic design Facebook group I belong to. So let me give you a little bit of background. Joanna, a fellow designer, posted a logo a couple of months ago to get some critiques about. She was designing it for a client and she didn't really know what direction to take it in. So she posted some stuff to ask for our opinion. Now, after some great comments and some ideas thrown back and forth, she decided to scrap what she was doing and go in a completely new direction and created a really nice logo. Now, the name of the company that Joanna was designing for was actually an acronym for some philosophy or something that the founder of the company had come up with. I don't remember exactly. So in the revised logo that she presented, she had a period between each letter in the name and an exclamation point at the end of it. And that was one of the critiques that she received from a lot of people is that you should lose the periods and lose the exclamation point at the end. Now, she agreed with us, but said that her client was really adamant at first to include those. Now, the critiquing went back and forth. There were some revisions along the way with the logo that she kept presenting to us. So finally, she let us know that the client had agreed to remove the periods and the exclamation point. And we thought then it'll end up turning out to be a great logo. Now, a few weeks passed by. And then just last week, Joanna pasted the final logo in the Facebook group saying this is what the client eventually went with. And I questioned her. I said, oh, the periods and the exclamation point are back. And she said, yes, she had convinced the client to remove them. But then the client had talked to some other people who convinced her to put them back. And in the end, that's what she went with. And this whole discussion that went over for a period of a couple of months and got me thinking about trying to convince our clients that what we're trying to do is in their best interest or that sometimes an idea that they want isn't always the best idea. And I know sometimes you can't convince your client. I'm not privy to the conversation Joanna had with her client, so I don't know what went back and forth between the two and how hard Joanna tried to sell the fact that the periods were probably not a good idea. But maybe she did an excellent job selling her idea, but the client just didn't want to listen. And that happens from time to time. Whenever you're running a graphic design business and a client comes to you, you've got to remember that the reason they're coming to you is, one, because they need somebody with your skill set But they're also coming to you because you are, in their eyes, an expert. Whether you consider yourself an expert or not, you know more than they do in the whole graphic design field. So in their eyes, that makes you an expert. So being that expert, they count on your knowledge, your expertise, your experience to tell them what is right and what is wrong. And that is a great feeling when a client comes and trusts you that much that they rely on what you say and they allow you to change their opinion of something. But there are times when no matter how hard you try to persuade them, there's just no going back. I remember years and years ago when I was a graphic designer working at the printing company, I had a new client come in 
wanted to design a logo for his brand new general contracting business. He was going to be hiring himself out to do minor home repairs, building sheds, building decks, houses if need be, but it was more of the smaller stuff. Well, he came to me with an idea. Because he worked mostly in wood, he wanted to have the logo look like it was on a wooden board. Now, when he first started saying that, I started thinking in my mind, okay, yeah, that can work. But then he turned to me and he says, you know what? I'm a huge Star Trek fan. Do you think you can write my business name in the Star Trek font? And I started hemming and hawing and telling him, you know, I don't know if that's a good idea. It really has nothing to do with woodworking or with general contractors or home building or or working with your hands or any of that stuff. But he was really adamant that I use a Star Trek font because he was a huge Trekkie. And then to top it off, he asked me if I can add a fish to the logo. And he didn't care how, if it was just a fish underneath the board or maybe a fish jumping over the board. And when I asked him, why do you want a fish in your logo? He told me that he had recently taken his six-year-old son out fishing and his son loved fishing so much that he kept asking to go back again and again and he thought it would please his son if he had a fish in his company's logo. Now, I remember when he told me that. I just stared at him dumbfounded. I didn't know what to say at that point. Now, I was still young. I was a little inexperienced at the time and I just didn't have a clue. There were so many things I could have told him to dissuade him from that idea. I mean, his son was six years old. Yes, maybe he enjoyed it, but do you know if it's going to become a passion of his? A few months down the road, he might not even think of fishing anymore, and now you have a fish stuck in your logo that people are going to question, why is it there? Now, I did my best at the time to try to convince him not to include it and to change the font, but as I said, I was inexperienced back then, and in the end, the manager at the print shop just told me to do what the client wanted, and I designed a logo that looked like a piece of wood with knots in it and the whole bit, with the company name written in a font very similar to the Star Trek font, and a fish that looked like it was jumping from behind the board, over the top, and heading right at you. Well, I know the client absolutely loved the logo, and I know that I absolutely hated it. I did not want to be associated with that logo at all. I didn't want anybody to know that I had done it. But what can you do? Now, maybe if I had better communication skills, or whatever the case may be, I could have convinced the client to do something else. Now, I don't think I ever saw him again after that, so I don't know what happened to his business. Maybe people didn't take him seriously and nobody wanted to hire him because of the stupid fish and Star Trek font. Or maybe he took his business out of town, I don't know. But I know that sometimes you just have to do what the client wants. But that should be a very, very small percentage of the time. As I said, clients usually come to you because you are experts. They come to you for your skills, skills that they don't have. And they recognize your ability, your knowledge, your education, your experience, and they're willing to pay for it. And you know this is a fact because if they weren't, they could have hired their next door neighbor's kid or their cousin's brother's little sister's best friend from high school who likes to doodle from time to time. There are so many cases of those over the years where people have gotten really inexperienced people to design stuff for them, and it shows. So the fact that a client has come to you shows that they are expecting something more than that. And your job is to deliver something more than that. You're not just there to appease them and put down to paper or put down on computer what they have in their mind. Your job is to shape the idea that they give you into something usable, memorable, believable, and something that not only they, but you will be proud of. So how do you go about convincing your clients that your idea is the right one or that possibly their idea is not such a good idea? Well, it all comes down to confidence. When you're talking to your client, You have to portray a certain amount of confidence to let them know that you are the expert that they hired. Whenever you're discussing a logo with a client or any job, it doesn't have to be a logo, but could be a website, flyer, a poster, whatever the case may be. You should always exude a certain amount of confidence as you're discussing ideas and always include your client in the ideas. Like If you're coming up with an idea and you want their opinion, don't ask your client, what do you think of this? Instead, tell your client, Why don't we try this? And include we. Don't say, I think I'm going to try this or I'll try this. Say, why don't we try this or or, let's try this. By including your client in the conversation with the we or let's, it makes them feel like they have some sort of control over the whole decision. And by not saying something like, what do you think of this or what's your opinion? And instead telling them, let's try this or let's go in this direction. It builds on the whole idea that you are the expert you know what you're doing, 
and you're trying to help them to achieve their goals. Now, in the conversation or possibly later at proofing stages or when you're showing a brief or whatever the case may be, clients will ask you sometimes why you want to go in a certain direction or why you want to use this idea or why their idea isn't a good idea. And this is where your actual knowledge, your experience comes into play. And again, confidence as well. If you don't think something's a good idea, don't tell the client that you don't think it's a good idea. Tell the client that it's not a good idea. When you tell a client you don't think something's a good idea, that leaves a little bit open for them to come in and say, you don't think it is, but there's a possibility that it may be. So why don't we try it out anyways? But if you come out and tell the client, that's not a good idea, they'll often trust your opinion and go with what you have to say. Now, as I said, knowledge of your field is really important at this point. Because when you're trying to dissuade a client for something, it's really good if you can explain to them why. I mean, if a client comes to you and they say, I want a logo and I want a picture of my face next to it and I want the type to look like it's a flag blowing in the wind and I want all the lettering to have a gradation in it and I want the whole logo to have a drop shadow behind it. Clients have all sorts of ideas of what they want and it's our job to tell them that those ideas are not always the best ideas. I can't tell you how many times over the years I've had to talk a client out of using an old English style font in all caps. And yet I see it all the time. And I just cringe at that. Any sort of old English font should never be used in all caps. But for some reason, some clients think it looks great. And that's where I have to use my knowledge to explain to them how difficult it is to read and a little bit of history behind the font And even go so far as to talk about how calligraphers used to draw these letters by hand and why the capitals and lowercase letters are the way they are in order to explain to them that your message will be much better received if you don't use it in all caps. When it comes to logos, clients sometimes don't think of the uses of a logo. They have all sorts of ideas in their head of what they want and they think it'll look great. But when you start explaining to them, well, what happens if you want to put that logo on the side of a pen? Or what happens if you want to embroider that logo in a shirt or have it etched in glass or stamped on the front of a trophy? All these explanations go a long way in convincing clients sometimes that their ideas are not always the best thing. The same can be said for color. Sometimes clients will want to choose a certain color just because they like that color, but maybe the color is totally inappropriate for what it is they're doing. I remember doing a logo for a guy several years ago who would help people in financial trouble so that they can avoid having to declare bankruptcy. And when I designed the logo, he wanted me to do it in red because it was his favorite color. Now, I convinced him to change it when I explained to him that his clients are people that are suffering financially and that he wants to come in and help them find a way to get out of their debt. And yet he wants to use a color on his logo that represents being in the hole, of not having any money. Now, it didn't take a lot of convincing once I told him that and I explained that and he realized right away the error of his ways. But it just goes to show you that sometimes clients don't think of these sort of things. He just knew that his favorite color was red. So when he designed a logo, he wanted it to be red. He never thought that red was a color associated with being in debt. And yes, that's the clientele he's going after. But that's not the image he wants to associate with them whenever they're hiring him. So the knowledge you've gained over the years of being a designer, the knowledge of typography, the knowledge of color, the knowledge of white space, the knowledge of layout flow, All of these things need to be put to use in order to convince your client that their idea is not the best idea or that something you're thinking of might be the direction to go in. Now, don't even get me started on white space. How many times do clients say, we've got this big blank space over here. Why don't we fill it up with some information? And white space is sometimes the hardest thing to sell to a client to make them realize that that blank area on the poster, on the flyer, on wherever it is, That blank area serves a purpose and doesn't need to be filled up. Now, unfortunately, that is a very hard sell to some people. And some clients just want to get all their money's worth. So say they're buying an ad in a magazine that's a certain dimension and they're paying a couple of thousand dollars for that ad. They want to make sure they get as much use out of it and fill it up with as much information as they can. So yes, white space is a very hard sell. But when you do convince a client of the benefits and how it can work, it can really make a huge difference. I designed a newspaper ad for a client many years ago. He was closing his store after being in business for just over 50 years, and he wanted to take out a full-page newspaper ad to thank everybody who had supported him in all that time. And he brought me in a list of organizations and people 
and groups and communities and other businesses and hundreds and hundreds of people that he wanted to thank. And he wanted photos of what the business used to look like and different renovations the store has had over the years and how it progressed to what it is today and all sorts of stuff. And I sat down with him. And first of all, I asked him about the list of people he wanted to thank. And was he 100% sure that he didn't miss anybody? And he told me, well, he's been in business for over 50 years, so he can't be sure that he hasn't missed anybody. So I convinced him that if he can't be 100% sure that he didn't miss anybody, then he shouldn't include anybody at all. So what I suggested to him was to take his full page ad in the newspaper and leave the page almost entirely blank. Just put his store's logo right in the middle of the page and underneath it the phrase, thank you to everyone who has supported us over the years. And that was it. Now, at first, he wasn't sure of this idea, but I convinced him of the impact this full page with just very minimal text on it and his logo, what sort of impact this would have. And he trusted me and he ran with it. And the next time I saw him, he thanked me for my idea and said he couldn't believe how many comments he got on the ad. For one, it was noticed by everybody who picked up that newspaper. You couldn't flip through the newspaper without noticing a big blank page with just a logo and a little bit of text in the middle of it. And what he was told by so many people was the way it was minimalized in the newspaper, they felt like the message was just for them. So sometimes convincing a client the white space is the right way to go is really tough. But when they do listen, it can really pay off. Now, as I said, some of them are apprehensive because of the amount they're paying. I don't remember the price he paid for a full page newspaper ad. And he felt like he was taking a big risk by not filling up that page. But in the end, it did pay off. So sharing your knowledge and your experience with your clients goes a long way to selling them on your ideas. Now, there is one other thing I want to talk about in regards to selling your ideas to your clients. And not to be crude, but there is a little bit of BS factor when it comes to being a graphic designer. Sometimes you have to sell an idea to a client when really you don't have a good reason behind it. And that's when you have to rely that your customer believes in the experience and the knowledge you have That's when you have to rely on your confidence to help sell something. But sometimes it just comes up to BS and dumb luck. I mean, when you present a logo to a client and they asked you, why did you go with the color blue? And you really don't have a reason other than you were in the mood for blue that day, which is obviously not something you should tell the client. Sometimes it just takes a little bit of BS, plus your confidence, plus your knowledge, plus your experience to sell an idea. Why did you use the color blue? Reality, no particular reason. It was just the first color you hit in the color palette. But you can explain to your client the meaning behind the color blue, color theory, and how when he explained his business and everything he has to do, in your mind, you just had a blue color that you thought would suit them. Or sometimes it might be as simple as saying that when I went to meet you at your office, I noticed that your carpet was blue. So I thought I'd design a logo that would suit the decor of your office. Now, I'm not telling you to lie to your clients, to make excuses, or to come up with tall tales. But as I said, you are supposed to be an expert. You're supposed to be confident in your abilities. And telling a client that you have no idea why you did it or you just did it on a whim really doesn't exude that confidence. So even when you don't have a reason for why you did something, you should still have an answer for your client for why it works. Now to finish off the topic, I just want to remind you that sometimes, no matter how confident you are, how much skill you have, how much knowledge and how much experience is behind you, or how well you can shovel the BS, sometimes there's just no convincing a client to see something the way you want them to see it. And in those cases, just like general contractors with Star Trek fonts and fish jumping from their logo, you just have to bite your tongue and do what the client wants. After all, they are the one paying the bills. I would love to know your stories on how you've interacted with clients in order to sell them something or when you haven't been able to sell them anything. Do you have any Star Trek fish jumping logos of your own? Some idea a client insisted on no matter how hard you tried to persuade them otherwise? Or do you have any stories of really bad ideas that you have been able to convince a client to change and came up with something brilliant? I would love for you to share them in the comments on the show notes page at resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 25. Now I have no listeners questions this week, but if you would like me to answer a question in a future episode of the Resourceful Designer podcast, please use my feedback form at resourcefuldesigner.com slash feedback and submit your question for consideration. Now, if you're enjoying the podcast, I would love for you to share it with your friends and other designers. 
they can visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash subscribe. It lists all the different ways you can subscribe to the podcast. Now, next week's episode, I'm going to be discussing how in order to attract more and better work, sometimes you need to raise your prices. Now, don't forget to check out this week's resource of the week, Backup Buddy, the easiest and most convenient way to back up, restore, or migrate a WordPress website. For more information, visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash backup buddy. Until next time, I am Mark Decote, wishing you all the best in your graphic design business. And as always, reminding you to stay creative. Thanks for listening to the Resourceful Designer Podcast at resourcefuldesigner.com.